How about now? Whoa. Okay, let's try all that again. Hello and welcome. On behalf of Murray State University and the Bar and Fine College of Business and the Department of Journalism and Mass Communication, I am pleased to welcome you to the McGahee Lecture on Press Freedom and Responsibility. My name is Kevin Qualls and I'm the chairman of the JMC department. And tonight, we are here to celebrate journalism and the legacy of a prior chair of JMC, and that is Dr. Robert McGahee, or as most of us know him, Doc. Doc gifted a sum of money to JMC so that we could continue to pr the pursuit of excellence in journalism. And the McGahee Fund for Excellence makes events like this possible. And in doing so, we continue the legacy of Doc McGahee. That legacy is why many of us are here tonight, because Doc spoke into our education, he spoke into our careers, and he spoke into our lives. The, the title of tonight's lecture is The Value of Dissent, and there has never been a better time to consider that, that value, that freedom of speech that we have, and to recognize the responsibility that we all share when we use the power of media. And to get us started, I am pleased to welcome a veteran journalist who is an alumnus of our program. She began her career in the studios of one of tonight's sponsors, WPSD-TV. And currently, she is the morning co-anchor of News Channel 5 in Nashville. And this evening, she is here to introduce our very first lecturer in the McGahee Lecture Series. So please join me in welcoming Murray's own Amy Bryan Watson. Thank you, Dr. Quarles. I haven't been in this building, or on this stage, I should say, since 1989, all campus sing. So it's been a while, for sure. It's nice to be home and good to see so many of you. It's an honor for me to be here. Um, Doc McGahey, my parents are here tonight. He was their best friend, and um, he is one of the main reasons that I have had success in, in the broadcast journalism, and I owe so much to him and loved him like so many of you all did as well. I'm happy to be here tonight to join the other members of the steering committee. It's an important event, and of course, I'd like to introduce them to you. And as I do that, if you would please stand. It's really hard to see the crowd. <laughs> so you all just stand uh, as I call your name and then just be seated, whatever you're most comfortable with. And I'll just go through these. Dr. Kaiser Lowe is an MSU graduate, former advisor to the MSU News and is a member of the faculty at the University of Georgia. Dr. Carol Teresina Hartman is the current advisor to the news and a member of the journalism faculty. Ms. Darlene Mazone is the CEO of Mazone Communications and publisher of Paducah Life Magazine and a former member of the MSU staff. Ms. Elaine Spaulding is president of the nationally recognized Rowan County Chamber of Commerce in Salisbury, North Carolina, also a former MSU graduate in journalism. Finally, the chair of the committee is retired JMC professor, Dr. Robert Valentine, a UK grad in communication, now celebrating his 49th year of work and play at Murray State. Alongside with Dr. Marcy Hinton's senior class in public relations, the staff of Office of Development and the Office of Marketing and Branding, and the underwriters and media partners named in your program, these folks are continuing the tradition of responsible journalism established back in 1927 by Dr. L.J. Horton and fostered by Dot McGahee. Like many people here, I started my career under Doc's advisement. I can tell you that a respect for your audience and a devotion to the truth, accuracy, and fairness are part of what you learn here at Murray State. That lesson, of course, has never been 
more important than it is today, the challenge of using the media effectively and with an awareness of responsibility to our society has never been greater. No contributor to the news is more aware of the tension between free speech and the social good than the cartoonist. Each day, the artist distills support, praise, or dissent into an image that can inform or enrage, or best of all, make us all think. Mark Murphy grew up in Ashland, Kentucky. He is a graduate of Notre Dame and University of Louisville Law School, a former prosecuting attorney. He now specializes in criminal defense, an Army veteran. He served in Germany and Central America. The Louisville Courier Journal began publishing his political cartoons in 2007, and he has drawn daily since then. His award-winning cartoons are also published in the Gannett USA Today Network, Louisville Public Media, the Kentucky Lantern, State's Journal, and the Louisville Eccentric Observer. He speaks on a regular basis on politics, his art, and social justice. Mark and his family, his wife joins him tonight, live in Louisville, Kentucky. We are very fortunate, of course, to have him here with us tonight as the inaugural speaker for the McGehee Lecture on Press Freedom and responsibility, and it is my honor to welcome Mark Murphy. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Amy. Uh, in my business, when you hear a news anchor reading your biography that way, you're afraid that you're gonna see a mugshot and that you're on the way to being indicted. So I was glad she was able to finish strong as she did. I also want to thank Kevin and the committee and um, Bob, of course. Um, this is a big deal for me. And I say that uh, so that you understand the seriousness with which I take the honor that you've bestowed upon me to honor Bob McGahee, to honor Doc McGahee. Um, I know that you hope that this will become an important part of the year every year here at Murray State, the Western Kentucky University, for a long time to come. I also appreciate the, st the strategy of starting with me in order to set the bar so low for the future that no matter who speaks next year, the trend will be upward. This auditorium is beautiful, the campus is beautiful, my wife and I have been treated so wonderfully. I wish you could see what I see from this stage. All of you, um, we're so grateful that you came. And the renovations uh, that I know that are taking place in this auditorium, I know that it's unfinished, uh, but I think that's appropriate because so are we, uh, both individually and, and as a country. I also wanna thank the generous sponsors uh, who have supported this so that we didn't have to, they didn't have to dip into the McKay Fund. We had a wonderful time with the students today, and I'm glad that some of them are here as well. In fact, a special welcome now to all of you who couldn't get dinner reservations for Valentine's Day and came here instead. This is, this is a bold move and quite a second option. I hope I can still make this a magical evening for all of you. Uh, as for me, my Valentine's Day gift to my own wife was to drive four hours west on the Western Kentucky Parkway so she could hear me talk. <laughs> this is where I remind everyone that on February 14th, 270 AD, St. Valentine was tortured and beheaded by Emperor Claudius. My wish for all of us is that our evening ends better than that. I've learned a lot about Doc McGahey since we've been here and in co prior conversations with Kevin. And what I learned and from what I think I understand about him, his generous spirit, his sense of humor, his brilliance, is that I hope that he's up there listening and watching right now to this first lecture. I suspect he's probably judging as well. And to Doc McGahey, I say, I'll do my best. I want to help start this as a legacy for you all here. Doc McGahee famously said, if you want to be a great communicator, remember, first you have to listen 
And second, never lose your sense of humor. I'll add, and this might seem obvious in many ways, but it's getting more difficult, that to be a great communicator, you have to communicate. And what I mean is, in order not to simply be a tree falling in the woods that no one hears, you have to communicate in a way that's published, that's broadcasted, and that's amplified. You want to be read. You're communicating because you want others to know what you're saying. And it's possible that in the United States today, in the written word and art, it's never been more difficult than it is right now. Global hedge funds own the papers, and their loyalty under the laws of the United States are to their shareholders. Real journalism is expensive and messy. Real editorial commentary is always messy. And it's not just expensive, but it's costly. Advertisers not only don't pay for ads on editorial pages, they pull their ads from all the other pages if they don't like what they see on the editorial pages. And they never like what they see on the editorial pages. Journalism suffers. The jobs are fewer. We had these discussions with the students today. And you have to be more creative, work harder, and be luckier than ever before just to be heard. And it's not just about the money. I couldn't believe what I was hearing last night, just as we were falling asleep in the hotel just down the street, I guess on 12th Street, that the governor of West Virginia had removed the CEO of West Virginia Public Radio and was replacing that person with his own comms director. Just two nights ago, while I was watching the Super Bowl, I saw Elon Musk sidle up to Rupert Murdoch in what qualifies in our days as an emperor's box. I don't have to tell you why I think none of those developments are good. And as for the students, it's difficult to imagine how different their worlds will be than mine, than ours. And within that world, how different the profession of journalism will be. In my lifetime, we've gone from cities with two, maybe three daily newspapers to cities, sometimes large cities, without a newspaper at all. I know that the Murray Ledger is bucking that trend. I found that out this evening, and congratulations in that regard. Advertising revenue and hedge fund profits drive the business and not the other way around. Reporting, especially investigative reporting, is underfunded, if at all. The journalists who survive will have to change. Today, a reporter's Twitter feed is more important to their own franchise or brand and to their message than even their own byline. In the midst of this, the question that we ask is, how can journalism anchor itself to the important principles of its past, to the principles of Doc McGahey, to hold on to them going forward? Journalism has many roles and is done in many different ways, especially today. But at its core, journalism, and what I mean here is nothing less than the freedom of the press, has as its primary mission the examination of government. Journalists report on sports and the arts and on lifestyles, and this is all entertaining, and in other ways also very, very important. In these ways, they describe to us the beauty around us, the achievements of other humans we can barely fathom and have to see or read to believe. Those journalists color our worlds. An entire semester of a communications class could be taught on one magazine article, if it's properly done. If you've ever read about Roger Federer by David Foster Wallace, you know what I'm talking about. But strictly speaking, it's the examination and investigation of the men and women who govern us, whom we allow to govern us, govern us, that makes journalism essential to our democracy. One way to know this is to imagine, for instance, no more movie reviews. We'd be sad and we'd feel something was missing. But imagine, on the other hand, no more reporting about the legislature or the governor or the president. Their work could be conducted in secret. 
They already try to do that. Raise your hand if you filed an open records request and got nothing in response after months of waiting except a completely, I see the hands, except a completely redacted volume of blank paper. Sadly, you don't have to imagine it. You don't have to imagine a United States without a free press examining its governments. It's happening right now in local newsrooms across the state and the nation. Congress will always get covered. The White House gets covered. But what happens in Washington is the tip of the iceberg. It's the icing on the cake. Your congressperson's vote on a particular issue or their speech to an empty chamber so they can film a campaign ad, there's still plenty of members of the press to cover that. But that congressman comes from somewhere. That congressperson has obligations to people somewhere who aren't in the nation's capital. They're back home, mostly in small towns and districts, even more so with state governments and city councils and school boards. MSNBC and CBS and the New York Times, they're not covering that. That used to be up to several statewide agencies and smaller hometown newspapers. Those are disappearing. People interested in history or journalism or the Supreme Court, or all of them, like me, know what Justice Louis Brandeis said, our Louisville's Supreme Court Justice. Sunlight, he said, is the best disinfectant, meaning, among other things, that work done in secret or in the dark corners and hallways of government needs to be exposed to the sunlight by the press, by journalists, to ensure those affairs are conducted honestly and in the interest of the community. Interestingly, he made this comment not about the national government and not about the president, but about the municipal government of his time in Boston, Massachusetts. Most of the work we call governing that actually affects all of us in our daily lives the most occurs in town halls and school board meetings. Actually, maybe not even there. John Oliver has pointed out that in the U.S. there are over 41,000 special districts and you have to say it that way, special districts. Kentucky has a lot of special districts. You might live in four of them and really have no idea that you do. These are agencies of local government that takes tax dollars to do a very specific thing. Fire and waste management are an example. But they're set up for everything. When you include school districts, they're the most common form of government in the United States. Most of the time, you don't even know they exist. They spend, in the United States, over $100 billion a year of your tax dollars. That's $16 billion a year more than the Russian government spends on its entire military. In Kentucky, every year, $3 billion of your tax dollars are spent on special districts. Except in the rarest of cases, these districts act in the dark, without the sunlight Justice Brandeis said was so important. And every day, the lights are being turned off in local newsrooms around the state and in the country. The result is an unexamined government. As journalists are withdrawn from the front lines by the corporations or are just starved out, the press can't live up to its important role as the fourth estate. That phrase, probably well known in this audience, was coined by Edmund Burke in a debate in Parliament in 1787. The other estates at the time were the clergy, the king, and commoners. In German, Spanish, and French, it's called the fourth power. That's how important it is. Freedom of the press in the United States is enshrined in the First Amendment to the Constitution, but is far less mentioned, far less frequently mentioned than freedom of speech, which today is being used as a weapon, inaccurately, and is misunderstood. Now within the larger fourth estate is the smaller group, the editorialists. And within that group of people who express an opinion are the political cartoonists. The first political cartoon in the United States. You've recognized it immediately when you saw it, and you know what it refers to. It was drawn, many of you may not know, by Ben Franklin, of all people, who seemed to have a lot of different talents. And it symbolized clearly and for the first time 
what all the editorial writers at the time were saying in writing, but the visual imagery mattered and the visual imagery stuck. The first important political cartoonist in the United States was a man that many of you may at least have heard about, and it was Thomas Nast. And interestingly, with all the work that he did, he focused on exactly what I was talking about, municipal governments, city governments. He's the originator of the figure that we know today as Santa Claus, and he also had a particular focus on the mayor of that time, Boss Tweed. This was one of the first times in the United States, it was a tradition in France, but it was one of the first times in the United States that a caricaturist, a political cartoonist in the United States, took these sorts of liberties to make points. You can see all the writing behind uh, the figure there that he drew. Did it have an impact? Boss Tweed was eventually forced out of office after the Tammany Hall scandal and everything else, Teapot Dome, and ran to Europe. He was identified in Europe, quite to his dismay, because the people in Europe who hadn't read English in the newspapers recognized his cartoons. And as Boss Tweed told the people that were taking care of him and protecting him at the time, my constituents can't read, but they can damn sure look at pictures. And that's a good way to characterize one of the aspects of that. Abraham Lincoln called Thomas Nast his greatest recruiter because of the efforts he made, the, overtly, um, the overt effort he did to take a side. And we're going to get to that a little bit later. Thomas Nast was also fearless, establishing a vein of fearlessness in editorial cartoonists in the United States. Keep in mind that this, this cartoon was written during the Reconstruction. And the images that he drew and the feeling that, you wanted, that he wanted to evoke from you is obvious from this cartoon. Fast forward a little bit to World War II, and there was a man who was just a soldier, a private, named Bill Malden. You see the objects behind him, that's Willie and Joe. And he became famous during World War II. He drew the ire of General Patton even, who threatened to have him thrown in the big brig and court-martialed, because he had the gall, even as a private, even as um, uh, an enlisted member, in the throes of World War II, he had the temerity and the courage to draw the horrible conditions the American soldiers were fighting in, the dirty water, the lack of food, how they were treated by their commanding officers. The soldiers, of course, loved him, and the generals didn't, and that established a pattern. When Bill Malden returned to private life, he was asked what he thought the job of a political cartoonist should be. And he said, if it's big, hit it. That seems a little broad, but he's right. He was the political cartoonist in Chicago when John Kennedy was assassinated. And he drew this image. It's impossible for someone in, in doing what I do to imagine, but he drew this image in a matter of just a few hours uh, because his newspaper, On Deadline, wanted to be the first to express in something other than words uh, the overwhelming sadness that the nation felt with Kennedy's assassination. And in doing so, he also established a new tradition, the cartoon without words at all. That symbol is very powerful. What's the state of political cartooning today? Is it important? The better question might be, do the powers that be, like General Patton, like Boss Tweed, still consider editorial cartooning dangerous? Gannett thinks so. Gannett signs some of my paychecks. They're the largest newspaper publisher in the United States, and within the last three years, they fired almost all of their editorial cartoonists. The ones who hang on have been reduced to one or two cartoons a week, and rules have been established by Gannett. Rule number one, this happened this year. Don't make fun of Fox News. Seems not right. Rule number two, don't criticize broadly an entire political party. And then rule number three, for the love of God, will you please draw some more sports and weather cartoons? Decisions are made with an eye to the bottom line not fair reporting or commentary. 
Overseas, in many countries, the stakes are higher. Authoritarian governments around the world imprison their cartoonists or force them to leave their homes and home countries. When I was stationed in Panama in the 1980s, its president was Manuel Noriega, and some of you remember that. The first thing he did when things got hot or messy or when people started asking too many questions, now remember that, when things got hot or messy or people started asking too many questions, that seems to be the role of the free press. He closed the presses. He'd send his guardia to La Prenza, lock the doors, arrest a few journalists, and call it a day. Living there then as I was and not being used to it, I can tell you it was terrifying. It was like a total eclipse of the sun. The sky went dark and the birds stopped singing because the ground was taken out from under your feet. Because with no press reporting, I could never have imagined this before. There was no one to place limits on the police. There was no one to place limits on the judiciary. There was no one to place limits on the president or the Congress there. The danger, real journalists and journalism and commentary presents to business is the same as it does to authoritarian governments. Journalism done well in its questions and it's in its pursuit of the facts can be an accidental act of dissent. Political art, meanwhile, is nearly always quite intentionally an act of dissent. In my work, I do try to stay on the right side of a fine line, the line that I was invited to discuss, the line that Kevin and I have discussed in class, and that's the line between dissent and inflaming. Some of my art, in some of my art, I try to just represent a circumstance. I can't tell you where and I've drawn many of these images. I pulled them up off, out of my, my own catalog because for some of them, quite unfortunately, they're, they've become timeless. And I don't mean that as a pat on my own back. I mean as a result of the fact that things haven't changed. Um, the American urban rural distinction ha has been around a long time. Um, in my art, I try to use images uh, to use as few words as possible. You know why I chose that image that, of, from Abraham Lincoln that Bill Malden had drawn? Because I think that while it's a valid political cartoon style, there's a lot of political cartoonists that use a lot of words, that have dialogues, that have the classic husband and wife standing, sitting next to each other, reading a newspaper in opposing chairs and talking about the news of the day. And while those are fabulous artists, I feel like there's enough words on the editorial page. There's enough news on the news page. There's enough uh, words on the front page that the images, in order to have the impact that I'd like to have, need to be immediately recognizable and then tweaked just a bit, as the image with Iwo Jima. I didn't know this when I chose this cartoon earlier, uh, a couple of weeks ago. I didn't know that there'd be another school shooting last night. I didn't know that three, I think three at least, would be killed at Michigan State University last night. I think it's our 63rd mass shooting, as that's defined, of 2023 in the United States. You may not even remember what Newtown is because it's become to refer, be referred to as Sandy Hook. Um, somebody reminded me in one of the classes this morning that uh, that was 10 years ago now. So I drew this image 10 years ago, vowing that we would never forget Newtown or Sandy Hook. And uh, because of the wave of money and other things, uh, disregard from part of Congress, state legislators, uh, we have forgotten. And tomorrow we'll forget about what happened at Michigan State University. In terms of the use of images, I drew this at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, there's reasons to be proud of America, and I'm very proud of America. Uh, I'm, I'm a veteran, and my father was a veteran of World War II, and my son's a veteran. Um, I've sworn oaths to protect the country. I've sworn oaths to prosecute fairly. Uh, and there are reasons that I'm proud of the United States. Um, I do recognize also, and I think it's important that um, I 
uh, encourage other people to think through these things that on its face, as the Statue of Liberty in this image, we do have strengths and beauty and history and icons. Um, but as uh, we all learned, and as is always the case, especially the poor learned during the pandemic, um, for all of that, people didn't have sick leave and a lot of them didn't have health insurance. And we still don't have a national health insurance plan. That caused a ripple effect, as you know, in terms of the labor market, in terms of who could work where and when, in terms of who was able to stay home and who couldn't stay home because they had to keep working. Of course, I have to comment on politicians and I have to comment on government. Um, some of the issues uh, are easily considered, as this one is. Um, Trump Tower, I think it's fair to say, without choosing sides, uh, was shown to be a, a tower built from fraud. And uh, while nothing's happened in that regard yet, I, think that I hope the nation may have learned a lesson there. Sometimes I'll draw a cartoon and other members of my family might suggest that maybe not everybody's gonna get this. And um, as the indictments of co-conspirators and as the net draws more closed around our former president, um, who cartoonists and others reflected in the color orange, um, I saw the dominoes falling. My response sometimes to the idea that maybe everyone won't get it is usually okay. Not everyone needs to get it. Um, I'm not selfishly just drawing for myself, but maybe I'm drawing for the select crowd that's thinking of those things in that way. I have an obligation, I think, to talk about the good news as well. In terms of bad news, uh, living in Louisville in 2020, um, there were very few people who could escape being involved one way or the other, whether it was because you were stuck in a traffic jam, uh, because of the protests, or whether you were involved in the protests yourselves. Um, one of the most important legal cases, one of the most important police operations, one of the most dramatic social events that occurred in the world uh, in 2020 occurred down the street from our home in Louisville, Kentucky. And um, I felt an obligation to draw frequently about that at the time. I felt an obligation to uh, express this opinion because there was a sense that other than the people who were in the street sacrificing uh, their time, their jobs, sometimes their well-being, um, there was very little other commentary that was overtly criminal, uh, critical of the police themselves. As a former prosecutor, I worked with the police. I know policing as well as other people that are in the industry and in the business. Um, it didn't pre prevent me from criticizing them in that way. If women who are playing basketball professionally in Europe can wear a Breonna Taylor t-shirt, felt like the political cartoonist in Louisville, Kentucky owed the community and, and owed the conversation his own take on that. On the other hand, in the last couple of years, there have been progress in the United States as well, which I love to comment on. I'd love to only ever draw about progress. Um, this is an example of using, as Bill Malden did, never at his level, uh, but an iconic image that people, I think most people would recognize, certainly people of a certain age, the image on the top of the federal marshals uh, escorting Ruby into school. And um, then when we had our first woman black justice confirmed, those same federal marshals, not the same ones, but the same agency is now escorting her back and forth to the courthouse. Um, that's a significant event, not just because I'm an attorney, but it was important to the United States. And this is another image where very few words were needed. Like newspapers, like journalism, I think that political cartoonists have an obligation to reflect where they're from as well. Um, this was my 2022 Kentucky legislative update, and you may not be able to read all the words there, but it still remains puzzling to me and very frustrating that in 2022, 
we have counties, districts, areas that can't use their own water. Um, what goes into that water and the ingredients, um, I could blow up and go in, but you can imagine uh, what, what caused that water to be that color. The neglect, the politics, um, the refusal to accept the fact that perhaps more taxes are needed, the ignoring of parts of our state in eastern Kentucky. Any political cartoonist in, 20, in, the, in the 2000s is going to draw about women's choice, about abortion, about health care, and about those things. And um, I use the analogy here of the Cumberland Gap uh, because there is a gap. There's an enormous gap. One of the side effects of the, lace, the most recent decisions about abortion in Kentucky at the highest levels of our government is that there's a gap, and it's a health care gap. Most rural counties in Kentucky don't have even one OBGYN. Now, I didn't know that myself. It's not the kind of thing, it's not my walking around knowledge. Um, and one of the greatest compliments that I receive about my cartoons, it's not about the art, uh, maybe for obvious reasons, and it's not about something that's on national scale, but it's when people tell me that they've learned something from what I've drawn. There are articles written about this. These are the articles that I read in order to draw this cartoon. But we're busy. We have a feed. We're looking through our phone. Maybe you're reading a print newspaper, but I didn't know that most counties in Kentucky, big counties, and there's 120 of them, only have one OBGYN. And uh, for a person who's presently living in Louisville, even though I grew up in Ashland, that was astounding to me. And if this cartoon informs six other people that that's the case, and one of those other six people tell their legislator, then that's as much of an impact as I can hope to have. Per capita, more people died in the Louisville Metro Corrections facility downtown, right across the street from the courthouse, in the last 14 months, then have died at Rikers Island in New York, New York. Um, that's an atrocity. And I made the joke earlier while we were at uh, the reception that there's the Eighth Amendment to the United States Constitution that prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. Well, it does. Um, and it doesn't have anything to do with receptions or speeches, it has to do with this. Um, the Courier did me the favor, and I have some very brave editors at The Courier. I criticized Gannett, but my people locally at The Courier Journal are fabulous, and they stand, um, sometimes they stand by my side, and sometimes they stand in front of me. On occasion, they'll stand behind me uh, when they have to, when the blows are coming, but they allowed me to publish this longer form cartoon that talked about the problems. One of the people who died, which is the final figure in this cartoon, if you can't see it, had already been approved for release from the jail. By the way, to be in the jail in Kentucky, with some exceptions, you're unconvicted. You're waiting trial. Generally speaking, as a lawyer, I can explain this, and you probably know this, that if you've been convicted, you're probably heading to prison if you've been convicted, and your sentence is more than a year. So the people who have died, now there's over 10 of them in Louisville's jail, uh, are innocent. They're quite literally innocent in our system of government. And this one, this last one, had already been approved for release, and then he died. A free press can be the line when we talk about building walls between tyranny and freedom, which gets us back to the point of this lecture, and that is back to fairness and the value of dissent without inflaming. Dissent takes all kinds and all approaches. If you're dissenting for a good reason, one that you believe in, you have to be yourself because it's hard. We're all different and we're all going to employ different methods and tactics. Some will never offend because it's not in them to offend. Others don't care one bit. Both approaches have some value, but where the rubber meets the road, in dangerous times, and these are dangerous times, there are conflicting principles. On the one hand, you can't burn down what you're defending. In military terms, you don't destroy the village to save the village. If you're building a better society, which you have to believe you are, 
How do you want that society to act once built? Once your victory is won? Well, first, there's never a victory to end all wars, even metaphoric, political, or philosophical wars. It's always and will always be a process. So if you abandon all civility, all empathy, and all balance when you criticize the opposition, you've invited chaos and increased the likelihood that your values that you were fighting for have been lost in the process. Winston Churchill was asked during World War II to devote resources from the arts in Britain to the military. And he said, then what are we fighting for? On the other hand, in my opinion, there are movements and messages and people so dangerous and so repugnant to the idea of a free and civilized people that there are no words and there is no art that is too strong or too aggressive. Provided the target is appropriately and fairly narrow. Criticism of the leaders, for instance, and not those they've convinced to follow them. Racism, anti-Semitism, hate toward young gay men and women that causes them to kill themselves, an unjust war, the relegation of women to second-class status. I think the greater danger when discussing these issues is not that one would divide or offend, but that in holding back for fear of offending, you give strength or comfort to the proponents of these evils. There aren't good people on both sides of some arguments. The media has frequently, I believe, failed to live up to its job to do journalism by defaulting to providing equal time to the very people who would close their doors if given the chance. They do this for a number of reasons, for entertainment purposes, to serve their advertisers, to serve their shareholders, and because it's easier. When they do this, they sacrifice accuracy on the altar of false equivalency. Now, I used to admit in response to criticism that I was biased. I did this to throw people off and to show that their accus accusations against my drawing and writing missed the point. I would say, well, of course I'm biased. And what I meant was, of course I have an opinion. However, I finally looked up the actual definition of bias. And while there are several forms, all of them include the same word, one way or the other. And that word is unfair. I didn't like that, and my immediate reaction was that that was the opposite of what I was trying to do or of who I wanted to be. When I was a prosecuting attorney, the ABA standards for prosecution described the best prosecutor's work as delivering hard blows, but fair. This begged another question. Who decides what's unfair? If we're talking about dissent, and specifically in this venue, dissent in journalism and art, the reason there's dissent is because there's a group who is the minority who believes they are in fact being treated unfairly that biases and prejudices are being used against them, that hate is being used against them. So if you're a dissenter, what is your obligation to be fair? For instance, there really are fascists, and you can't argue with them because they don't accept the facts. But what's the option, and how do you avoid being a divider? This begs the following question. Whether there are times when you don't want to be a uniter. Times when being a uniter is exactly what the fascists, the authoritarians, the white supremacists, and the common political crooks want you to be. Because your uniting in that circumstance is a form of acceptance. I think fairness 
as the lodestone here, in this sense, can be understood in its simplest form. Your commentary is fair if, while it may be strong, it may be blunt, it's based on the facts as you understand them. And here you've got to be careful because the argument easily veers into whether what you've said is the truth. Truth is too difficult of a concept, and it's unhelpful to this discussion, I believe. It also brings in formal religion. It brings in philosophy. It brings in theology. Facts, on the other hand, aren't in good faith disputable. If your argument, your opinion, and your commentary or art are based on the facts, they're fair. And if it's fair, others can decide whether what you've done is uniting or dividing. That's not your job. Your job is to create the best art fairly in the way I've described. It's the curse of being an artist, and, and this probably applies to songwriters and poets and musicians and painters, that many times we sit down and think, this will be the greatest political cartoon ever drawn. This will be the greatest song ever written. My cartoon will move people and inspire them. It will change their minds, and they'll agree with me, and they will then be correct. Of course, that never happens. The reality is, my cartoons are more like bumper stickers. When I was running for Commonwealth's attorney, one of the old guys giving me advice told me that bumper stickers don't change anybody's minds, but they still have value. The driver behind you at the stop sign sees your bumper sticker. They already agree with you. You haven't changed their mind, but it tells them that they're not alone, that they're not crazy. It's the same as commentary or a cartoon. As an artist, I've read and watched the same reports and the same news that you have. They've also made me angry or worried or sad. You feel the same, but have no way to express it. By the grace of God, I have a special set of skills that allows me to express my own feelings and opinion and show them to the world. If I do, and if I have the courage, as Bill Malden said, to hit it, if it's big, when it's published, and you see that, like the person seeing the bumper sticker, then you know that you're not alone. You know that you're not crazy. It's a small act of courage. It's not courage in battle. It's not the kind of courage it takes to care for a parent or a child who's suffering. But it is courage nonetheless. Journalism, done right, requires courage. Because sometimes, if you're fair, you can be a divider. You can also be a supporter and an ally. The founder of Nike, Phil Knight, said somewhat the same thing when he talked about his marketing plan for Nike at the very beginning. He said, these shoes aren't for triathletes and Olympians alone. They're for you. He said, those days when the alarm clock goes off and it's not even 6 a.m. and you know it's raining and it's cold, but you get up anyway, you put your shoes on, and you head out the door and start running. It's on those mornings when it's cold and dark. I'm under the, the, the street light cheering you on, telling you you're not alone. I don't need to remind this audience that the work of journalism is important. Journalism has been called the first draft of history. Journalism and journalists have to be supported and have to be protected. But in the end, you protect yourselves. And you protect yourselves by being fair. If you're fair and that unites, that's good. If it divides on occasion, if it reflects the divisions that are based in fact, 
perhaps that's just as important. Thank you very much. Thanks. I should have mentioned at the beginning that you should be saving up your questions because we're here to answer questions um, and very happy to. And the good news is I won't be able to know who you are because I can't see you. That's, that's what I'm up here for. Um, um, Bob Valentine has mic in hand, and, and Bob will come to you uh, with that mic uh, for your questions. And, and Mark is right. You can't see anything up here except these lights. <laughs> and so what I'm going to try to do is, is help point out where the questions are. So uh, I'm hoping that uh, questions you may have. Uh, we had a great time in class this morning. Our students had a lot of observations and questions, and it turned into a, a pretty fun time. So uh, any questions, please raise your hand, uh, and, and Bob will get that microphone to you. Uh, Ed Marlowe, Murray State graduate, WKDZ radio reporter. A quick question for you, Mr. Murphy. Uh, to draw, who taught you how to draw, and, and how do you continue to build on this? Because um, this is a medium that maybe we don't learn in college. Um, actually, no one taught me how to draw, and everybody can say it all at one time. That's obvious. <laughs> but. Um, kind of, I was always the kid who drew, and as I've tried to explain to the, to the students and to my own children, you know, there wasn't a lot to do, especially if it rained, and we were inside, and, you know, there, you didn't even have TV. You had three television stations, and in the middle of the day, it wasn't anything you wanted to watch, at least not anything that I, as an eight-year-old, wanted to watch. Um, you know, I don't know whether it's chicken or egg, but I've always been drawn to, to artistic images. Not classically, but um, you grow up. I mean, one of my heroes is Charles Schultz, right? And uh, that Charles Schultz becomes Bill Watterson with Calvin and Hobbes. And um, uh, I, I truly like the riddle or the puzzle of, as you can imagine, um, like that image or some of these other images, they don't, they don't appear in my head, and it's just a matter of me drawing them. Um, I'm thinking of a million different things, and it's a matter of, uh, it's almost like sculpture. You, you know, when they talk about somebody sculpting out of marble, you're not adding, you're taking things away. Um, I really enjoy the drawing. I, I enjoy both of it. I enjoy the drawing process. The drawing process is easy uh, for me, and one of the reasons it is is because, because I have another full-time job, the whole time I've been doing this, I was, I was stressed for time. And so I, I didn't get up and have a cup of coffee in the morning like editorial cartoonists were able to do classically and go meet with the editorial board and then they made some suggestions and then I had some suggestions and then I had the whole rest of the day until it had to go be dropped into zinc acid, you know, um, to be cut um, onto plates at 4 p.m. If I have an idea when I get home from work, um, that I've developed at lunch or during a particularly dull deposition, um, I, can, um, I can usually execute in about an hour and a half. And that's created a style that tends to be simple and black and white and look maybe sometimes even just like a coloring book, which if I had more time, I may have gone in another direction. I didn't have a choice. I'm kind of stuck with it now. So. Mr. Murphy, Tony Tilton, just a random person here. Uh, <laughs> I wonder how many times you've had a cartoon refused. Has it ever been one that was too controversial for it to be published? Yes. Or is, does that happen often? I mean, and that's, is that censor, censorship of you? No, or it's just not your idea, it's, but you know, no, no, how often? No, no one who rejects anything I've drawn could be considered a censor. You know, I mean, that's, they're just considered wise, probably, <laughs> and concerned about their job. Um, 
So two stories to answer your question, Tony. One of them is, one of the first cartoons I ever got rejected, and I'm looking at the, uh, the demographic of this audience. Um, do you all remember the Ashley Judd hockey poster? Is that a thing? It was on every dorm room for, you know, in my generation, we all had Farrah Fawcett on the wall, and then there's another generation. I see some of the younger guys. Oh, yeah, I remember that. So Ashley Judd was wearing only a hockey jersey, um, and uh, she had her back to the camera, and it was a gorgeous, it was uh, from an artistic perspective. It was a wonderful picture, and um, it was a UK thing, right? And so um, there was a time when Ashley Judd was going to run against Mitch McConnell. Remember that? To me, it's obvious, I'm sure it's obvious to everybody in this room, that the cartoon that I would draw would be Mitch McConnell half-naked in a hockey jersey. <laughs> and um, they, actually, the editors loved it, but they said, you got to hold your fire on Mitch, because you're going to have to do something more important about him later, and don't do it here. Um, on a more serious level, and I had this discussion uh, in one of the classes today, uh, there was a time... Uh, let's say before all of this, that I would compare someone to a Nazi. I thought it was fair. I mean, the things that I said, I believe, that I thought it was based on fact. Um, they weren't actually members of the German Nazi Socialist Party of 1937, but they were acting like it. And early on, those were rejected. And they said, we don't do that. And people who have been in the media a long time understand that. You don't compare someone who's really good to Mother Teresa right away. You don't compare somebody who's really bad to Adolf Hitler right away. And I understood that. But they rejected it. Well, the bad news is that fast forward about 10 years, and there are actual Nazis. And um, I've used that image uh, appropriately and fairly and probably understatedly many times since then. Um, uh, the same, we, we're speaking frankly here, the same thing happened with the women's health issue and with choice. There was a time in the past when I offered my editors a cartoon um, that included a coat hanger that represented what was going to happen to women's health uh, in the poorer places like you know, the Cumberland Gap, right, where there's only one OBGYN in the town. Not only did that become a reality because of what happened to Roe, but we've moved out to the other side. Um, and I no longer use it. Uh, because it's, pa frankly, it's passe. And that's awful that it's passe. Um, that's a problem. I also got a message from a, a, a woman's leader, and, and she said, appreciate what you're doing, but we don't use that image anymore. So there's good news and bad news to this. She said, we don't use that image anymore because it misleads the less informed young women of our state to believe that that's their only option now that abortion's illegal. We want them to know, this is the good news, bad news, we want them to know that there's an abortion pill, that they still have rights, that they still have a choice. And so two days ago, our Attorney General, Daniel, Daniel Cameron, joined 22 other attorneys general to file a lawsuit to ban the dispensing of abortion pills. So. Maybe the image will come back, sadly. Sure. Yes, sir. Hey, I'm Ed Rohde. I'm a teacher here at Murray, and I had a question about your, your medium. Are you painting? Or are you using chalk? Or are you digital now? It's all digital. Um, traveling as a lawyer and carrying a large white pad around, along with all my pens, um, one time I was traveling with an associate um, he was in the back, I was in the front. I don't know how that happened. And the plane went up quickly uh, on takeoff. I dropped my pens. Every single one of them rolled all the way back to the rear of the airplane. And he was there, fortunately, to pick him up. He also thought, this isn't why I went to law school. Um, my work and everyone's work changed dramatically when uh, good new technology came out. It's still a blank sheet of paper. And uh, it took a while to learn how to draw on an iPad. Um, the advantages are twofold. One is when I'm finished, I can just press send. I don't have to drive downtown. I don't have to scan them in anywhere. Um, the other advantage is 
uh, it doesn't help you draw, obviously. You, everyone again, obviously. But they do um, allow me to make mass erasures. I don't even know how to use, um, um, uh, what's the apps? I don't know how to use any apps uh, uh, to cheat with. And I'm glad I don't. It's still just me drawing them. There's about four or five, well, I could just about say there's about four or five editorial cartoonists in the nation. What I was going to say was there's about four or five left that are still using paper. Um, and actually, I didn't want to go into too much detail because you were already so patient. But as recently as about 15 years ago, um, I'm a member of the AAEC, the American Association of Editorial Cartoonists. Uh, th there were still over 100 full-time editorial cartoonists in the nation. That organization considers you a full-time editorial cartoonist if you have health insurance. <laughs> And now, today, at our most recent conference, which was held in a, you know, in a Denny's outside Racine, Wisconsin, <laughs> there, were, there, are, there are less than 30 full-time editorial cartoonists in the nation um, for the reasons that I said. And, you know, I, I talked about editorial cartooning because I was somewhat asked to, and that's what I do, but also it's a little bit of the canary in the coal mine, too. You know, get rid of the editorial cartoonists first. Then you get rid of the, there's not an editorial board at the Courier Journal anymore. Sometimes they'll publish something and they'll call it the editorial board, but the, there's not an editorial board. Um, and I, I love that, I love that franchise. I love that entity. And I just, I, I, I weep for what it's become. The people that are still there are heroes, but it's, um, they've gotten rid of the editorialists. Uh, they've fired the newsroom. And this is happening everywhere except on the planet, except apparently in Murray, Kentucky, with the Murray Ledger. <laughs> so, what, you know, what, where, he's in the audience somewhere. I mean, um, I'm going to preach that gospel uh, because that was quite a story. But, yeah, digital. Uh, hi, Dana Thompson, the uh, uh, librarian here. Um, I was wondering how... Now careful, I know that you have tenure, so <laughs> I know you can say anything you want, but be kind. I, yes, of course. Um, one of the things you said is that some of your images aren't for everybody. They may not understand it at first glance. But if you were to try to teach your students how to read an editorial cartoon, how might you start? It's a great question. Um, there are different ways to learn. You know, I mean, um, developing is, I had a, psycho a psychiatrist approach me after a presentation a long time ago, and um, she described to me somewhat briefly um, the different, and you all are educators, you know these things, uh, but the different ways that we perceive and learn things. And there's the, the, the thing that we learned to do first was see things and react. Right, I guess, saber-toothed tiger got to run. Um, uh, you know, apple, probably, well, maybe you shouldn't have eaten that apple originally, but after that, after that big bad first time, you know, a grape, let's eat that. Um, and images have that power, and it's like backing into the knowledge. So if I was, for instance, I think the most obtuse image that I showed you might be the dominoes falling against the orange, not falling against the orange domino because it's too far away. Well, I mean, I'm thinking about the next generation, and I didn't even think about this at the time. There's probably a lot of people don't even know how, know how to play dominoes, or why that image, you know, is reflective of the dominoes collapsing upon each other. I mean, I grew up with the domino theory of communism, right? And um, so you could post the image and say, almost like a Rorschach, what's this mean? And it is a Rorschach, I guess, in a way, because you may end up having to finally say, and those are indictments, and orange is Donald Trump. I could have, and uh, one of my sons is an editor uh, for me, and uh, he's the one who keeps saying, take it off, take it off, take it off. Um, I could have labeled that last, there may have been an edition of that, a version of that, that I have labeled the orange domino Donald Trump. Um, and, but in the end, it's just not me. Um, and I'm not lording knowledge over anyone. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a very, like I said, these aren't works of art, and I understand the role that I play when I was talking about that. 
I'm not changing any minds, and it's not the greatest piece of art ever created. It's a bumper sticker, really, and, but not every, I don't care if everyone gets it. Uh, there's a, there, there are people there who are going to see that and think, I, I get that now, and I appreciate the direction that that took, um, and sometimes it's a little selfish. I mean, you know, I guess songwriters write songs for themselves sometimes, you know, um, but I really loved that one. I really did. You know, they're kind of like, you don't, you, yeah. people are asked, songwriters are asked, what's their favorite song? And it's, say, it's like trying to pick among your children. Well, I have an easy time picking among my children, first of all. And I have an easy, easy time picking among my um, cartoons, too. So I don't struggle with that the way others do. My name's Michael Williams. I'm an editor, which means I'm full of opinions. So I don't have a question, I've just got opinion to share with you. Uh, I'm editor and publisher of a uh, newspaper uh, 25 miles south of here in Paris, Tennessee. Um, I just want you to know uh, that uh, uh, editorial cartoonists are, are not all uh, drying up. Our small town of uh, uh, 10,000 people in Paris we, uh, for the last few months, uh, have a new um, uh, editorial cartoonist. Our high school basketball coach retired. He loves to draw. He's, uh, he came to us and, and started offering us editorial cartoons, and now we have one just about every issue. Uh, and he's here, he's in ball cap right on the front row down here, Mike Greer. <laughs> <laughs> Silver lining. Well, I have a soft spot. First of all, that's fabulous news. I have, there's a soft spot in my heart for basketball coaches, first. And I have a special soft spot in my heart for people that would rather ask forgiveness than permission, which you obviously did. And that's wonderful. That's how I started. I, without telling my wife, I practiced for a couple of weeks and took one down to the courier and said, what do you all think? And uh, I was prepared to be, I guess, one of the things that probably being a basketball coach, uh, you're used to rejection and loss. And, and uh, I am too, and um, good for you. That's fabulous. I hope, I, um, I hope you like these. <laughs> I'm going to follow yours. Awesome. Awesome. That is good news. Uh, Garrett Wyden, I'm a music business student here at uh, Murray. Uh, I'm currently in a class that's centered around the idea of media literacy. Uh, as a political cartoonist, do you worry that upcoming generations are not going to be so media literate in the idea of political cartoons? And if so, what can we do to become more literate with them? I don't think that the upcoming, I'm not one of these old guys that thinks that the upcoming generation is going to be media illiterate. I think that you, there's a bigger danger with your generation. Um, uh, I think because things are so easy, because you, right now I could find six news stories and read them to you, uh, and you could match that with 12 more, and so we're literate with a small L, I think. But then there's a capital L literacy, and that is um, what stories have been vetted, what stories have had an editor look at them, what stories um, have you cross-referenced. Um, the, the great editorial cartoonist, uh, Ann Telnes, uh, who you all should follow on Twitter and Facebook and everything else, from the Washington Post. She's won a Pulitzer, uh, deservedly so. And she teaches a class in media literacy. And she talks about uh, the four or five steps. She's actually drawn a cartoon that are the four or five steps to fact checking the things that you're reading. Now, specifically with regard to um, editorial cartoons, I, you know, I, I hope it's not a lost art. Um, I think they have value. Well, I know it's not a lost art be, uh, because in Europe, they thrive. And not using a lot of verbiage and not using a lot of words in mind, I'm a fan of the European style. 
a copycat of the European style. Makes sense, because if you're trying to translate into six different languages overseas, then uh, it's better if you don't have a paragraph of dialogue. Um, where they're not imprisoned overseas, they're treated as heroes. So it seems to be somewhat of a uniquely American problem right now. I mean, we were going to have a convention before the pandemic in Canada. The Canadian cartoonists were going to have us up, and they were going to introduce us to Parliament. And we all thought, to shoot us? I mean, why are you, that doesn't make any sense. We were going to get medals. So it is sort of a uniquely American problem. Um, and I hope that enough basketball coaches around the country, uh, you know, decide that this is their next career and, and get into it. And it's the thing that I never got the chance to tell the students this today, Kevin, but it's the last thing I always say to students when they ask, journalism's hard, you're such a downer, you know, you, you keep talking about how there's no jobs and everything's closing up except in Murray at the Ledger, and, oh, and, and cartoonists are in jail, and why, you know, why are we even here? And what I say to them is the same thing they say to musicians and young artists in the musical field. If you want to play music, play music. You know, and you may have to support yourself other ways, but don't stop doing that. And so if you want to draw, I say to the artists, do that. If you want to be a journalist, if you want to be an investigative reporter, and we just told you that there are no more jobs as investigative reporters. Well, first of all, it's not true. There's a lot of jobs as investigative reporters. As I said early on in my talk, you just have to be more creative, be a little grittier, and uh, work harder, unfortunately, than you would have when you just got the gig at the local newspaper, but it's there. It's there. Are we just ruining people at this point? Should we stop? Kevin's making the long walk. Guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. At the beginning of his presentation, Mark said that he was going to set a low bar for the future McGahey lectures. I think he failed in that. I think that you set the bar up here, and I'm grateful for you being here today. It's been a long day. He's been with our students starting at 9.30 this morning, and uh, we're grateful to have him here. I'm grateful to you for being here this evening, too, and celebrating the legacy of Doc and the McGahey FFE. So be careful going home. Thank you for sharing your Valentine's Day with us. Thank you so much. Such a good you, you said nice things. I hope it was okay.